Welcome to another episode of We Don't Die, where my goal is to give you evidence that although our bodies will disappear, we survive physical death. Every episode, we explore this topic with men and women who have incredible stories, and many have it made it their life's purpose of sharing the reality of life after death. I'm your host, Sandra Champlain, author of the international bestseller, We Don't Die, A Skeptic's Discovery of Life After Death. Today on our show, we have a great, great, great guest. We have Dr. P.M.H. Atwater. She's written approximately 15 books on the subject of near-death experiences. We'll call them NDEs, and has personally had three near-death experiences. Dr. Atwater is one of the original researchers of the near-death phenomena, having begun her work in 1978. She's interviewed, oh, let me take that back. She's had ses sessions with nearly 4,000 children and adults who have had near-death experiences. Her latest book, The Complete Idiot's Guide to NDEs, is one of the most comprehensive books on the subject. Dr. Atwater, thank you for being here today. Oh, I, I, it's, just, it's just so much fun being here and also uh, hearing an error because the Idiot's Book ha has been out of print for decades, or at least a decade. So the latest book is the big book of near-death experiences. Okay. So let's insert that. It's a variable a veritable encyclopedia of the entire field, and it was written for busy people on the go. That means you can get a, a whole lot of information by just reading one page, because there's a lot of pictures, there's a lot of cartoons, there's a lot of sidebars, and short stories, and, you know, charts. And you just flip through that thing and get all kinds of stuff. And I apologize about the error. And one thing, <laughs> as we all know, it is to be human, is these shows are unedited, unscripted, and what, <laughs> what you see is what you get. So can I assume that the information that was in your out-of-print Complete Idiot's Guide is in your new book, The Big Book of Near-Death Experiences? Oh, a lot, lot more. Okay, we love that. A lot more. Oh, fantastic. And let me... Let me just first ask you something that's been a burning question. Sure. It, what does the PMH stand for? Not a thing. <laughs> Not a thing. That's my, that's my <laughs> full legal name. Okay. So PMH, I get to be the alphabet lady. Well, then that's wonderful. <laughs> Although I have a sneaky suspicion when your fa parents first saw a beautiful baby girl. <laughs> They're... Look, I've had five fathers and two mothers, so that's another wow. story. Okay, so we won't get into that. <laughs> no, and, we won't that. <laughs> and that's okay. And then I also um, said interview, which I know we had spoken before the show started, that you don't do interviews with people. You do sessions with adults and children. And if you could just tell us a little bit about your backstory. I mean, you said you were raised in a police station. What do you mean by that? Well, my dad was a cop, or I should say my adopted father was a, a police officer, a police officer. So I spent a lot of time in the police station, day and night. Um, uh, he would, uh, I would go to the police station and walk there, and he would drive me home during coffee breaks or what have you. So, it, it, you know, it became like a second home, mm -hmm. and I was sort of raised in that environment, and the police officers there knew everybody, everybody knew me, um, interrogation rooms, jail, uh, you know, it was like, it was literally a second home, so I absorbed everything I possibly could, and among the things I absorbed from my dad was how to do, in, um, how to do interviews or you might call it interrogations. Oh, but, gotcha. Yep. Uh, but <laughs> specifically interviews. Let's say there's an accident, and there are four different witnesses. You never, ever, ever go up to uh, uh, an individual and say anything but, did you see anything? You can't say car till they say car. You can't say accident till they say accident. You never use language in advance of the individual. That's one of the little tips I have with the scientific method, 
Right. It's because you're sending out questionnaires. Sorry, folks, you're biasing your work because you're using words in advance of the individual. They're picking up words just from your questionnaire. So that's leading the witness or something like Absolutely that, Absolutely right? leading the witness. And Dad also said um, the, the body says more than the mouth does. So you need to watch bodies. You need to watch shoulders and arms and hips and feet and head and, and the pupils of the eyes. You need to study the individual as well as uh, engage them in conversations. So I would do this. Then I would do the same thing with the significant others, if I could get into a home with a spouse or the children or, or uh, the neighbor or the health care giver or, or the boss, maybe fellow employees. So you're talking about now um, sessions well, you've had with near-death experience, people that Well, are... right, but you've got to also validate, um, is what they're saying noticeable, noticeable, is this really happening in the home? What are other people seeing and feeling? So you've got to have that broader perspective mm. because no experiencer, and, and I'm, I'm going to capitalize that in big letters, no experiencer knows how much they have changed for years afterward. They just don't know. So when you get into the homes, you begin to find out. You get the rest of the story. And then I would test that with other people in different parts of our country, uh, different ethnic environments, uh, again and again and again. You know, <laughs> this is funny. Just to say I was, I was obsessive compulsive would be an understatement. Oh, that's funny. I mean, it really is. You went for it. Well, I think having the dad that you did, and it's interesting that you say questioning other people in life because you and me and those listening today we've all had our experiences through life and at any time you know we feel like well like I feel I'm just Sandra but if you were actually to go back 15 20 years in time I'm a whole different person right. after having the experiences I've had so um even going back a few years yeah and, and it's interesting because we don't I don't think we presently realize that we're living a whole different quality of life that maybe wasn't available before. Especially if, if you've been stimulated by one of these intense experiences that really challenges your belief system. Yeah. Can you... And then you really change. Oh, yeah. And I'd love to hear some of those stories. And I know, um, you know, for me, even though I've written my book and I've done my studies, there's still the part of me and whether you call it the ego or the identity that wants to hang on to when I die this is it you know I have fears in life my dad passed away four years ago is he really still around am I just making up everything that I've experienced you know so there's this piece of us that needs some confirmation and I think one of the intents that I have with you and all the guests is to hear some of the stories that just say, yeah, you know what, this is real. This is a real thing. Our lives are for a purpose. We don't die. We go on. So anything well, you know, you certainly I could speak for millions of, millions of people mm -hmm. here and say that the most common phrase experiencers say after their experience is these four words, always there is life. Oh, wow. Now we're talking millions of people worldwide, any culture, any country, always there is life. So you can't ignore that. You have to stop a minute and say, whoa, wait a minute here. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the major after effects of the experience is the loss of the fear of death. Um, there's a few that come back with that fear, but very, very few. Um, so most of them, most of them become so comfortable with that idea of death, or at least familiar, that that's not a big deal anymore. So 
that's that's not something they deal with, the idea of dying. Right. But rather the idea of what can I do about life? What can I do to make this world a better place? What can I do to uh, exalt and, um, and, and to display the breath of God? What can I do as part of that breath to spread th this idea of altruism, compassion, and love? So that's major for, for most of them. Not for everybody, certainly, but the vast majority. So, you know, having said that, um, the cases are, some of them are kind of easy to take. That is mm -hmm. to say, it's just an out-of-body experience. And I'm not going to say just an out-of-body experience because all of them are very... Right, but you know, compared very, to some grander uh, stories and experiences. Sure, they're, they're right? all very lucid and, and just incredible stories. But some of them just make you stop in your tracks. And one of them that, that made me stop in my tracks was uh, Margaret Fields Keene. Okay. This is a number of years ago. Margaret um, rushed to the hospital with phlebitis in her legs. Bad, bad, bad. Really bad case. Um, rushed into surgery, died on the operating table. They were able to resuscitate her. When she's in the recovery room, then um, she, she then began to do what she was told to do in her experience. In her near-death experience, she was told that she was a healer. Now, this is a 4-H mom. She raised horses, mm -hmm. uh, taught, in, uh, taught in school. Um, had no idea of anything like that. Uh, but she was to heal even in darkest Africa. Wow. So there she is coming out of surgery, and there's a fellow there um, that is screaming from pain, and she said she just went over to him. How she went over, I don't know. She went over to him and comforted him, and he quit screaming, and he, you know, settled right down. Mm -hmm. And then at the end of the recovery room was another room, and all the windows were blackened out. So she went over to that room, passed through the wall, and on the other side is this little boy. She said a white boy burned black. So, so a major burn case. The child, the little boy, was about maybe six, maybe six years of age. And, um, you know, a terminal case. Right. She sat, sat on the edge of the bed. He could clearly see her. He could talk with her. She introduced herself. Um, told all about herself, and then she talked to the little boy about death. And she said, you know, it's really all right if you leave now. Your, your parents will be okay. They'll be able to handle this. And that um, you'll have a good death. It will be easy. And this is what death is like. And so she told him all about it. She told him all about what it would be like with his, his parents and that it was okay to leave. Then she went back to her body. Now, a month later, she's in a wheelchair. She's out of the hospital. She's in um, a horse racing uh, tent area because they're having big horse shows. Uh -huh. And remember, she raises horses. Right. And her daughter was in a major um, showing, and she won. And they announced it over the bra, you know, over the loudspeakers that, and that she was the daughter of. And and there was this big rustle in the crowd, and this 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 couple made their way to Margaret, who's sitting in the wheelchair, and and they said to her. We've been looking all over for you. We're the parents of the, uh, of, the, of the burned boy. He did die. He told us all about um, what you said to him. Wow. And we want you to know 
that that enabled us to be able to handle his death. Wow. Okay, how did they know her name? How did they know she knew all about their son? Mm -hmm. No one in the hospital room had discussed the boy in the room. Nobody. How did she get in there? How did she sit on the edge of that bed in full view? Right. And the boy saw her. And she made an indentation on the bed. She made sure that uh, um, she sat on the bed in a way that, that would not be harmful or painful to him. How could all this happen if all we have is a physical body? Right. How do you feel Margaret went on to living or some of the many people that you've had sessions with? <laughs> Margaret wound up yeah. marrying a man from South Africa. She went to South Africa and, and, and finally learned how to, uh, and made partnerships with, with the Sangomas over there and started healing with the witch doctors in darkest Africa. Wow. So she went on to fulfill the she purpose. Went on. She did. She did. She wow. taught many people her healing techniques, by the way. The healing is so amazing and there's something that came up to me when you were talking is, you know, I, I brought up in the beginning that we all have this oh, identity, ego, this analytical mind. Um, mine always first says, you know, that's not possible. There's no way that's possible. And um, one thing I just want to let people know is you are not the little voice inside of your head. Our little voices don't always tell us reality. Um, thousands of years ago, we all know people thought the earth was flat and we knew it was. The little voice said it was. And so it came as a big surprise when suddenly the earth is round. And any of us listening right now, I mean, if you look at the things around you, I see books and I'm in my house and I see all kinds of lights and everything. And where we're living is really a miracle because at one point our earth was just stone and ground and leaves and trees and water and wind and things like that and out of that we have electricity we have our iPhones we have um, this communication that we have I didn't even ask you Dr. Atwater where in the world are you now right like, now I'm living I'm living seven miles north of Charlottesville, Virginia. Oh, very nice area. And I am in Massachusetts. And I come from Idaho. Wow. But with this, that we are, have so many miles between us that we can speak as if we are in the same room together. And yeah. we actually are. So where we are living is a miraculous world. None of us can see the wireless internet that connects my computer to your phone and in this miraculous world. So don't take the words that the little voice in your head is saying, or might not be saying, but it might be saying, um, as the truth. Because we need one of, and one of the, um, measures I have for my show Dr. Atwater is that I want interviews to produce goosebumps. You know that feeling and I think goosebumps are actually being in touch with the divine or the divine part of us but it's that, that moment that takes our breath away and when you said always there is life and you told Margaret's story and about the little boy I think five times and presently I have the goosebumps so we're right on track accomplishing <laughs> our mission because truly, not everyone's mission might be to go to Africa and, and be a healer. But I want to say for each individual, there's a reason we're on earth. And, and maybe it's not that you have to find your reason. Maybe you actually get to say what your reason is. And once that fear of dying and that fear of death is gone, yes, you can be compassionate. And yes, you can make a difference for another. And I truly feel that making a difference for another person is the best feeling on the planet. So I have another question, though. So sure. many people say, and i just looking for, uh, maybe you have some examples of when people do die and they cross over, that they're greeted by relatives or friends, or can you speak about that? Because 
Well, we we call that um, the greeter, and um, most of the greeters people face when they first die are indeed relatives. That's that, a happy thought. That, that's the most common. A lot of them are greeted by animals, oh, especially pets who've died and got on before. Great. A lot of them are greeted also by angels or light beings mm -hmm. or uh, some kind of guide or guardian or, or just a being of some kind. Some are greeted by religious figures. Um, so we have all kinds of different greeters that greet people um, who have crossed over. That's good news. Yeah, and there are all kinds of different greeters. Um, something that, what, what, would, what would be interesting to consider, though, is in different cultures, the greeters are sometimes a little bit different. Let's say, for instance, Vietnam, mm -hmm. and we're talking about the Buddhist culture. Uh, people there, when they cross over, especially children, are most often greeted by um, Yamatuts. A Yamatut is a servant of the Lord Yama, the Lord of the Underworld. So, uh, one, one, one of the things I found so interesting when I was doing my work, when you get someone in Wyoming who's met by maybe uh, more of uh, a Native American kind of person, right. And, and someone who's in Vietnam, greeted by Yamatut, and, uh, you know, different people all over the world. So I'd have them draw it. You know, draw me a picture of your greeter. And um, inevitably, there's a certain commonality to the greeter. There's something about how, ooh, um, how much light they have, i.e. radiance. Um, how much they know about you, whether they, whether they, whether you recognize them or not, mm -hmm. and how accommodating they are. And that includes animals. A lot of children are met by birds. Um, birds are very common, sometimes adults, mm -hmm. but, you know, uh, with children, a lot of birds. So we, we have this, this mix of, of life. That, that continues after life. It's like you don't lose that 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 uh, that spark, and, and you begin to realize that the spark we call life is so much bigger, so much more immense than we think it is. Mm. That really, almost. Um, it's, it's like we're almost more alive when we're dead than we are when we're alive. And, and I'm not saying that to encourage that crossover, but I am saying that to indicate that what we call life is so immense and so powerful that it extends to the furthest reaches of the universe. It extends to every particle and substance. It is so awesome Anita, that we can't describe sorry, it. Sorry to interrupt you. Um, Anita Morjani has a book called Dying to Be Me. I don't know yeah, if you Yeah, I know her. Yeah, oh, <laughs> incredible. But she says um, you're just saying that life is so much more than just we experience she talks about in her book um, life as we know it is like being like walking into a big warehouse with all the lights off except for our one little flashlight and that's life comparing that to life as we know it and when she had her near-death experience it's like all the lights went on in this giant warehouse yeah. just showing her how much bigger it is so I oh, completely is. get although I haven't experienced it what you're getting at that there's so much more um, Dr. Atwater I would like well two things one is before I forget, your website is, correct me w if I'm wrong. Yep, go ahead. 
www.pmhatwater.com. Dot com. You have so a free monthly a newsletter. Word, all lowercase. Hmm? You have a free monthly newsletter. I have a free monthly newsletter. Get on my website and sign up. And uh, a really important issue went out last week, the July 2014 issue about electrical sensitivity and some of the uh, anomalies that near-death experiencers and those that like them display and have and how to handle it, especially in storms, um, tornadoes, earthquakes, lightning storms, all this kind of thing. Uh, very, very important issue. Thank you for that. And what I'd like to do, too, is I read a most beautiful excerpt of, um, it's called What It Feels Like to Die, and it's from your book, Beyond the Light, The Mysteries and Revelations of Near-Death Experiences. May I read that? Sure. Because it, I've read it five times this morning <laughs> what it feels like to die any pain to be suffered comes first instinctively you fight to live that is automatic it is inconceivable to the conscious mind that any other reality could possibly exist beside the earth world of matter bounded by space and time we are used to it we have been trained since birth to live and thrive in it we know ourselves to be ourselves by the external stimuli we receive. Life tells us who we are, and we accept its telling. That, too, is automatic and to be expected. Your body goes limp. Your heart stops. No more air flows in or out. You lose sight, feeling, and movement, although the ability to hear goes last. Identity ceases. The you that you once were becomes only a memory. There is no pain at the moment of death, only peaceful silence, calm, quiet. But you still exist. It is not, it is easy not to breathe. In fact, it is easier, more comfortable, and infinitely more natural not to breathe than to breathe. The biggest surprise for most people in dying is to realize that dying does not end life. Whether darkness or light comes next, or some kind of event, be it positive, negative, or somewhere in between, expected or unexpected, the biggest surprise of all is to realize you are still you. You can think, you can still remember, you can still see, hear, move, reason, wonder, feel, question, and tell jokes, if you wish. You are still alive, very much alive, actually more alive after death than at any time since you were last born. Only the way of all this is different. Different because you no longer wear a dense body to filter and amplify the various sensations you once had regarded as the only indicators of what constitutes life. You had always been taught one has to wear a body to live. If you expect to die when you die, you will be disappointed. The only thing dying does is help you release, slough off, and discard the jacket you once were, you once wore, commonly referred to as a body. When you die, you lose your body. That's all there is to it. Nothing else is lost. You are not your body. It is just something you wear for a while, because living in the earth plane is infinitely more meaningful and more involved if you are encased in its trappings and subject to its rules. Dr. Atwater, our time is closing but I want to tell you, you have just been a sheer joy, an inspiration. I want to give you a big hug. Oh, and, thank you. And do this again because I want to hear more of your stories. <laughs> if you're willing, um, I would certainly love sure, that. Sure, I'd love to.
I'd love to be back. Oh, you're just just a delight. And congratulations with your new show. The show is going That's great. Success. There's a, a television show that I'm coming out with. There's all kinds of great things. And, of course, Wonderful. You know, thousands of readers around the world making a difference. Um, so I want to thank again Dr. Atwater. And, again, it was our sincere pleasure to have you here today. And I'd like to remind you, our listener, to visit WeDon'tDieRadio.com where you can find out more about PMH Atwater, about her books and her links, as well as some of our past guests. And you can also join our Insiders Club where you can enter for free monthly prizes. And I've got some very special secret gifts if you join. So I'm not going to tell you anything else about that. This is Sandra Champlain. I believe life is an education for the soul and that your life here on earth is important. In, in closing, in the words of Neil Donald Walsh, life begins at the end of your comfort zone. I invite each one of us to reach outside of our comfort zones and take one action towards our dream today. Will you do that? I will if you will. Thanks for listening, and I'll see you soon. Mm -hmm.